is time for Around the 412 with Smitty and Tyler. Welcome back to another episode of Around the 412. As Josh said, I am Tyler. With me, as always, is my co-host, Smitty. Be sure to go follow us on all of our social medias at Around the 412. If you're watching on YouTube, it is on the little scroll wheel down at the bottom as well. You can see it, everything that we're a part of. Um, and when you're listening to the podcast, be sure to go check out the description. We got everything custom designs link for Facebook and Etsy. It's our friend Haley Wagger Small Business. She does customized clothing. So you go check out the links there. This is the Around the 412 Steelers show. Unfortunately, last week we talked about the Steelers being eliminated from postseason mm-hmm. contention with their loss to the Bills. Got into some a little bit of postseason talk and talking about uh, potential changes, especially like offensive coordinator changes. And there's been a lot more talk of that this week. So uh, it, it's it's been a busy off season, even though it's only been like a week. Yeah, and I think we're not going to slow down. I think that you're going to see uh, more candidates' names come out throughout the rest of the week. Uh, I think that you will see probably what they expect to be their first round of interviews wrapped up towards the end of the week. Uh, and then you'll see guys come in that they like for second interviews. Now, the one that's going to be interesting to me is a guy that I actually have at the top of who I'd like to see in Clint Kubiak, who they cannot interview until San Francisco season comes to an end in person. You can do virtual interviews. Obviously you do have the week where they have like in between the NFC championship and Super Bowl, I guess, to be able to have that window as well if he wants to right now, but are the Steelers going to play that waiting game or do they want to have this process wrapped up? Um, You know, I guess it's going to come down to their patience level, but Two candidates to talk about, Zach Robinson, who they requested permission, but it's just a formality that Rams cannot block him from taking a position ahead of where he's at right now, only if it was something lateral. So you can't block a guy from getting promoted. So they're going to interview him. Uh, And then Cliff Kingsbury, uh, former head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, obviously at one point very coveted offensive mind to bring his scheme into the NFL, and we saw how that went. Um, so let's talk about those guys. First and foremost, Zach Robinson. You actually gave him a shout last week on the show for a guy that you thought maybe could be in the mix. Um, while I like the idea, I didn't know that he necessarily fit the criteria that the Steelers were looking for based off what they laid out of what they were looking for. Um, certainly, um, intrigued me, you know, just 37 years old, comes from the McVay tree, uh, pretty diverse background, former quarterback has a background with Mason Rudolph. Should he be brought back into the fold? Um, he's an up and coming guy. I think whether it's the Steelers or somebody else, he's going to be an offensive coordinator, whether it's this cycle or the next one for sure. If not this year, um, I just like the idea, regardless of if he ends up being the guy to get the job that they're bringing a guy like this in for an interview at the very least and and picking his brain to see if he is a fit. Uh, It intrigues me and I'm all of a sudden wondering, okay, maybe they're casting a bit wider of a net than we first thought. Yeah, for everybody who watches our show, listens to our show, anything, uh, I got to give myself my own flowers. I got to pat myself on the back for bringing him (laughs) up last week. Listen, I know a lot of you probably think Smitty is the only one that knows ball on this show. I I know some ball. Not as much as Smitty, but I know a little bit of ball. Uh, I'm just patting myself on the back for mentioning him before there was even smoke to him with the Steelers. Uh, But... I, I and I mentioned it last week, like why I liked him. I, I think that it's a good fit for what the organization needs from an offensive coordinator. I think that the relationship he could grow with Kenny Pickett, having been a former quarterback himself, coaching the position, and then being in the Sean McVay tree, like you just mentioned, that is something that's coveted by not just the Steelers but any other team. It's it's really like if it's a McVay tree, Shanahan tree, like there's there's certain coaches nowadays offensively that are going to be more coveted if you came from those guys than others and i think that he would fit that bill perfectly now whether he is going to be a good play caller or not that yet remains to be seen he's never done that part of the job before even at like the college Mm -hmm. level he's only coached in the nfl really so i i understand the hesitancy from that end of it but as far as the what he can bring just from a player coach position um standpoint like what he could do for Kenny Pickett and I mentioned it last week I think that's probably what a lot of people thought that Matt Canada could do with the Steelers is bring the best out of Kenny Pickett I think that's something that Zach Robinson could do um now as as a play caller like I said you have no idea what you're going to get from him he's never done it before Mm -hmm. but I'm at least intrigued to see 
what if he does end up being the guy now don't get us wrong there's going to be at least uh probably close to 10 other guys that's going to be at least interviewed um before they make a decision yeah. I, w- I would love if they just like keep pumping them out and i'd love that if the decision got done early um within the next few weeks i, I think that would be pretty cool but I, I i do think as far as the two guys that are named he would be my preference um between him and cliff kingsbury for sure and I think at least from an offensive schematics perspective, it would be intriguing to see what he could come up with for, for a style of offensive play that they would call. Now we'd see how he does as a play caller, but I think at least coming from McVay, you know that he has at least has some of that, some of that creativity to be able to provide more spark to this offense that we haven't seen in really years. Uh, everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie. I think that's what this is, is, you know, he's just the next guy in line from the McVay tree to go on somewhere else. Um, and I think honestly that this, what this tells me, it just speaks volumes in my opinion, in terms of how Tomlin and this organization feel about Sean McVay and his offense. You know, I think that they just really covet what he's able to do. And I think whether it's, you know, Zach Robinson now or, or some, somebody else, you know, maybe even, um, Man, just adding like a, a Jake Peets, who's their pass game specialist for the Rams in some capacity, promoting him on the staff somewhere. And I'm not talking about him as an offensive coordinator, but giving him a role. Um, I just think in some way, shape or form, you got to poach from one of these trees um, and just get somebody in that has been a part of that scheme and, and been a part of those concepts. Because we talked a lot about the pass game, but man, you know, McVay systems, Shanahan systems, those guys can run the football, too. Um, like I mean, Williams did this year. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's really, they open things up. Um, but he's been credited more with what that passing game has done in man, you know, getting what they did out of a rookie Puka and Akua Tutu Atwell actually looked like an NFL player this year. Cooper cups, Cooper cup, obviously but a resurgence of Matthew Stafford after having the injury that we didn't know if he was going to come back from. There was a lot of speculation about retirement for him. And this is all behind an offensive line. That's I, I don't bottom five, in my opinion, in terms of the talent that they had on that line. So to be able to mask with that offensive line, was giving them and still put out that offensive product. Now, I understand it's McVay, a lot of that offense, sure, but McVay himself was also crediting Zach Robinson for a lot of the way that those young players, especially, like I mentioned, Puka Nakua, Tutu Atwell, were brought along this year within that offense. So, yeah, again, whether it's in Pittsburgh right now, somewhere else right now, or if he has to wait maybe one more year, uh, this guy's going to be an offensive coordinator for sure by the time he's 38. Yeah, well, you're mentioning what Puka Nakua did and what the receivers look like in that. Imagine what a guy like George Pickens could benefit from if he had a guy like that controlling the offense. I mean, and that's funny to say because George Pickens did have nearly an 1,100-yard season. I feel like we kind Mm -hmm. of overlooked that for for how we feel the season went. Um, But I I just feel like that that could be someone that gets the most out of this offense. I don't think we're going to have a rookie receiver um, that's going to be – I mean, they might not even take a receiver in the draft or anything like that. And I don't expect yeah. them to take one high. But as far as like young receivers on this team goes, George Pickens is someone that I think could benefit from it well. Um, I, I think that that is something that you need to get out of this offense is is not just from the quarterback play, but you need to get the young stars that we're expecting high expectations from. We need to start to be able to see that on a consistent basis. Now, like I said. George Pickens had nearly 1,100 yards on the season. That's less than the slouch about. I mean, that's that's fantastic. But mm-hmm. we need to see more consistent play from some of these receivers. I feel like it's too streaky, way too hot and cold. And if his offense is going to be able to do that on a consistent level, I think that would be great. Yeah, I, I look at the design touches that he's a, that they were, his guys were able to get within that Rams offense. Um, you know, the, the way that these guys are schemed open consistently on tape, I mean – Matthew Stafford had at least one option on every single play that was completely wide open. Um, yeah, the spa- the route spacing was fantastic, something we haven't seen. I mean, look at Nakua in that time. last game when he was going for the records. They literally were targeting him for a purpose, and he was still getting open. And then as soon as he got the records, they pulled him out. But but that's just to say, like, they he can get guys open, and it's it can get specific guys open when they need to. I think the, the route creativity could be something that – is a lot more advanced than what you saw under Matt Canada's offense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a fair point too, for sure. Um, 
so yeah, Zach Robinson would be a guy that I could sign up for. Again, I get the, the lack of play calling experience. I'm actually intrigued by the idea if they could pull this off with him as the offensive coordinator. And then maybe one of these other guys we're talking about, like a Pep Hamilton as the quarterback's coach, um, because it kind of gives you that safety net too, as a guy that has obviously more experience, has called plays and somebody else to work directly with Kenny Pickett, you know, potentially Mason Rudolph, whoever the quarterback room is working directly with those guys. Um, you know, it almost makes me wonder right now they're interviewing guys for the offensive coordinator position, but bringing in a group of guys, could they also be potentially interviewing them? Okay. So right now you're interviewing for the offensive coordinator position, but once they fill that, could they potentially look to also fill the quarterback coach spot with guys that they're interviewing right now? That could be the case. Although I, I looked at what you brought up last week too, where you bring in an offensive coordinator, typically that guy is going to get to fill out his staff with, with the people he chooses. So I mean, there may be a little bit, but I, I would think that well, that's, they're at least leaving the options the open. Yeah. Yeah. To me, so we, we talked about that, uh, Alan and I did today because I, I meant, or was that yesterday? Might have been yesterday. But I, I brought that up. And uh, no, it would have had to been today because we're going to talk about Kingsbury. But that to me is the difference because Robinson's a first time offensive coordinator. I feel like the Steelers can kind of, I, I, bullying him is not the right way. I mean, it's the Steelers' decision, but like, it's easier with a first-time offensive coordinator say, okay, we're going to bring this guy in as your quarterback coach as opposed to you getting to fill out your entire staff. Yeah. With a guy like you know, Cliff Kingsbury, who has the reputation of maybe not being the best working with other people, yeah, uh, I, I, think that's probably, I think that's probably a harder sell for him to not be able to either get to fill out his own staff or take that role away from him. Maybe he doesn't even want to have his own quarterback coach. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Let, let, I guess, let, okay, let's talk about the Kingsbury one now. Um, kind of a, a, a bomb dropped on 93.7, the fan. Peter King on there talking about uh, the Steelers with uh, the guys today on 93.7 and said that uh, Kingsbury was meeting with the Steelers. No one else had reported that or anything, and it wasn't even like he, he put it out there like in an article or anything like that, just kind of dropped it, <laughs> a little nugget on the radio. Um Obviously has the name, you know, high profile name again, kind of came into the NFL with a ton of buzz for what his offenses were doing in college at the time. He's worked with a lot of high profile quarterbacks. He's gotten a lot out of quarterbacks specifically. Um, but this is a, this is one where like the Robinson, I'm also intrigued by the desire to talk to this guy and interview him. I'm okay with that, with that part of the process. Uh, I do not want him to be the next offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't see the fit from either side. Um, you know, I just mentioned, you know, in college, his offense was so intriguing and how it would translate to the NFL level. It's kind of like a modern version of the air raid offense, which I, I just personally believe is better suited for college. I don't know that, that that translates well to the NFL. I think we've seen that. I also think that we've seen his offenses every single year start out better than they finish. I think as time goes on in season, Teams have been able to adapt to what he does offensively every single year that he was a head coach for the Arizona Cardinals. Um, I just think it, it, it bottoms out. Uh, and I think, honestly, like Murray's playmaking is kind of what masked it all to me. I don't know that he was necessarily progressing and getting better developing Kyler Murray as a passer. I just think his pure athleticism, his ability to do what he does out of the pocket and be a magician was kind of masking a lot of flaws within that offense. I would also be worried about, you know, for I, again, I, I just don't see the fit with Kenny Pickett. I understand Mason Rudolph may have ran something similar in college, but hasn't played in that type of system in the NFL. Um, but if, if the Steelers are hell bent on Kenny Pickett, you know, being the QB one, definitely do not see the fit with Cliff Kingsbury as the offensive coordinator. And I also would worry about, you know, the run game uh, under him. I, you know, it's a modern version of the air raid offense. It, Arizona did have some success on the ground. They were about a middle of the pack offense in terms of running the ball in his tenure overall. There was actually a year where they were pretty, they were like sixth or seventh in the NFL or something like that. But overall, I just, I don't see the fit um, with the personnel. Um, I don't love the situational play calling. And again, I, I think he's just much better suited to be a guy at the college ranks than at the NFL ranks. And that's not even really diving into, you know, the personal stuff that we've heard. Um, both from somebody that we are friends with that I've had conversations with about covering him and just don't really, haven't really, didn't really enjoy the process of covering him. Um, 
and just the stories that are all out there in terms of you know how he was with with ownership and upper management and stuff like that i just there's a lot of red flags here for me just don't think it's a fit we actually got asked a question about him so i guess you know let's just get into that now because uh john here said cliff and justin fields with the run game and weapons we have on the outside we're signing up for this right okay i will say in chicago is, I, yeah I, sure i mean why not honestly no 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 but all jokes aside, I think it was a better fit in Chicago. Now, I think they got a slam dunk there with Shane Waldron. That was my number one candidate um, with that hire. But specifically with Justin Fields, with DJ Moore, uh, with where they're going to be picking, potentially adding more weapons there, I like the fit of Kingsbury there more than in Pittsburgh, for sure. So you could, if I was a Bears fan and you were asking me that question, I'm signing up for that. I'm I'm not signing up for Kingsbury in Pittsburgh personally. Uh, I understand the appeal for sure. Again, I just I think it goes south in a hurry here if that's the case. Uh, I just don't think it's a it's a fit both on and off the field for him. The guy stinks. Um, I I I think that that was <laughs> fa fairly obvious going back to when he was a head coach at Texas Tech. I specifically remember whenever you, me, and Herb. We're recording a podcast back in that would have been like what 20, 2019, early 2019. And we were talking about Cliff Kingsbury being hired by uh Arizona, the Arizona Cardinals, and we were debating on like whether Kyler is going to be the number one pick now and everything like that. I specifically yeah. remember talking about Cliff Kingsbury and how stupid mm -hmm. it was that he got promoted to an NFL head coach just immediately after a five and seven season at Texas tech, which mean you his best season at Texas tech was his first season at Texas tech in 2013. Every year after that was pretty abysmal. He only had one more winning season and then he had, he had Patrick a, every, Mahomes there. He had Patrick freaking Mahomes. Uh, that's, <laughs> that is literally his legacy as a head football coach, at least in college. I wouldn't say this for the NFL, but in college mm -hmm. he got quarterbacks that were able to put up big numbers, but he always coached terrible teams because he yeah. only had one winning season after his first season with the Texas Tech Raiders. So it, it made no sense to me why he would have been promoted to a head coach in the NFL from Texas Tech. And I get that there's probably several excuses people would have brought up, like, oh, maybe they want to try out that offense in the NFL. You see what he can do with, with Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes was, was having some early success in his career. He was his head coach. I get that. It still makes absolutely no sense in my mind. So the fact that he fizzled out in Arizona, and then you, not even just Arizona, I feel like something that people aren't going to bring up when they should when you talk about Cliff Kingsbury is he went to USC. Now, whether it was all on Cliff Kingsbury or not, Caleb Williams did not have the same season that he did last year when he won the Heisman. He, Caleb Williams sure, yeah. was less of a player this past season of college football with Cliff Kingsbury as his offensive coordinator. Now, whether that is all on Cliff Kingsbury, and, and then college football has a lot of extreme factors when it comes to NIL, transfer portal, and all that sort of stuff. I get it. But we can't ignore the fact that his most recent coaching tenure – was probably considered a failure among USC fans and among a lot of people compared to what it could have been considering that you had arguably the best player in college football, arguably going to be the number one overall pick this season. I want nothing to do with Cliff Kingsbury. Absolutely nothing to do with it. I think that the offense, like you're saying, that 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 air raid offense, it's best suited for college. It doesn't work in the NFL. But even if it did work in the NFL, you don't have a quarterback to run an air raid offense. If you want to have Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen or Justin Herbert or, or somebody who could be actually functional in an air raid offense at this level that has the arm talent, that has the quarterback IQ to be able to do that. Because Air Raid like, is, is pretty much something not only just the Steelers do not want to do, but the NFL doesn't want to do, because the Air Raid is pretty much not running the ball at all. That's, that's practically what it is. And so we found out later in the season that the Steelers' run game was actually pretty good, and that's how they were having success offensively. So that's not going to happen. But despite all that, you do not have a quarterback that is going to be able to do that. This, they're not, they're not going to bring in a quarterback, and Kenny Pickett is not going to be able to run that offense. I want absolutely nothing to do with Cliff Kingsbury. I think it would be a terrible hire and be counterproductive from what the Steelers should be trying to do. I will say, like, the quarterback that he's worked with, very impressive, uh, you know, going back to Houston, Case Keenum, Johnny Manziel, 
um, Baker Mayfield, then to Davis Webb, who played in the NFL. Um, I'll say you're talking about some of the best college quarterbacks of all time. Patrick Mahomes is the only one on that list that has NFL success, like sustained NFL success. I mean, Baker's been okay, but Menzel, Case Keenum, like none of those guys were, it was all college. It's, and then it's, of, Kurt, of course, uh, Kyler in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, Kyler. I mean, uh, Kyler improved probably this past season without Cliff Kingsbury. Then they need Drew Petzing. Yeah, I, Drew I think, I think everything is pointing against Cliff Kingsbury. In, in in when you look at every single factor for whether whether it's pre Arizona at Arizona, post Arizona at USC, everything is just screaming red flag to me. Yeah, I would agree. Um, we won't get into all the questions yet just because I wanted to bring up um, one more thing. And this is a topic that Alan and I talked about as well, um, because I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. How far away are the Pittsburgh Steelers? You know, you look at the roster right now. They were a playoff team, uh, 10 wins, despite what they got at the quarterback position. They are definitely getting older in some spots. Um, but like, how far away do you think that the Steelers realistically are? Or are they just void of talent at the most important positions that's what i think it is i i i don't think that the steelers are that far away if i'm being completely honest i think that the fact that you had the offense you did and you still won 10 games with the potential that you could have won 12 if you look back at those arizona and new england losses that were two win teams at the time if if they had anything competent going on offensively they could have done that as well and you get to 12 wins with this roster, with this team, the, the inefficiency on offense, I don't think that the Steelers are that far away. I, I think that the shame is you're wasting the prime of some of these mainly defensive players that you've got on this roster, so they better need to turn it around quicker than later because if you take too long, then you're talking about getting out of the prime of TJ, getting out of the prime of, of Fitzpatrick. We've already had the conversation on this show whether yeah. uh, a guy like Cam Hayward is even going to be back or not, but – I don't think they're that far away. I think that they are competent quarterback play away and an offensive coordinator and then more sustained offensive line like pr- production away from being a serious contender. And when I say contender, I don't mean like Super Bowl favorite, but I think a sure. team that could go on a run. Like I, I, I don't think that there's that big of a difference from a personnel standpoint outside of a few key positions from a team like Pittsburgh and a team like Green Bay or a team like Detroit, mm. I, I I don't. I, I thought you were going to say Detroit because that's the one Allen said. Like in, in Jared Goff, all credit to him. I think he's I think he's very good. He's not an elite talent. Like the NFC Championship is Brock Purdy versus Jared Goff. Yeah, that's this is the sad part is that I would love either of those quarterback options right now compared to what we yeah, have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's where I'm at with it. And I, I thought this as soon as the Steelers regular season ended, I thought it as, as soon as the Steelers postseason ended after that one game, the Steelers are not that far away from being a decent team. Like they're being a yeah. can playoff contending team, making a run in the playoffs. It, it can happen. You never know what happens when you get to the postseason. Obviously, if you look at the way the Steelers were this season, they're a step below everybody, especially playing in, in Buffalo week one. They're a step below Buffalo. But if you have more efficient play, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, you're talking about a team that could go on a run. Specifically the quarterback. Like I I know that this name just gets thrown around there because it's like everybody talks about this as like the, you know, that second tier of quarterback, just drop him in anywhere and you're a better football team. But like Kirk Cousins, drop him a, a healthy Kirk Cousins on the Steelers this year. I don't know. I mean, they, they might've beat Buffalo the way that that game went. I don't think that that's too far off. Actually, probably not playing Buffalo. What am I talking about? Because You're not, not playing season. Buffalo yeah. because you probably don't lose to New England. You probably don't lose to Arizona. I, I, yeah. This this team is not far off. And if you get healthy just, play from defense and efficient play from quarterback and maybe a center or two that can actually block, you know, I think that this two. could be a pretty good team. I mean, yeah, we don't really have a center on a team. Let's be completely yeah, honest. Take two. Get two. <laughs> Get two, and one of them has to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think that's as crazy. No, I, I, and I agree with you. That's, I mean, and Alan did too, based off the conversation we had. It's, 
it's more about the positions where they don't have an answer than it is the overall roster. Like the overall roster is pretty good. Uh, That's why I think it feels so far away. Like it feels like there's such a difference because you look at a team that has Josh Allen, that has Patrick Mahomes in the division. You mean that has, even though they didn't make the playoffs, like Joe Burrow, or you look at Mm -hmm. who's playing this weekend, Lamar Jackson in the division. Like there's so many guys that is key quarterback play, especially in the AFC now. I mean, the NFL in general is so much talent at quarterback, but the AFC is is loaded. And so I feel like that's why it probably feels so much further away for a lot of Steeler fans because they look at everywhere else and the quarterbacks that they have, and they just know that the Steelers, from what they have right now, they can't compete. Yeah, and they see the window closing, I think, you know, for for Cam Hayward, for TJ Watt, for Minka, you know, the, the window is now for those guys on defense. So it's I think it's a level of frustration there, too. Um, let's get into the questions, though. I just mentioned Cam Hayward. Gary comes right at us with a question about Cam Hayward. Uh, how about this? If Cam Hayward doesn't retire, how can they mitigate his usage? Doesn't have effective downs. He's a cumulative issue for an offense. Um. I think this goes back to, you know, we're going to get obviously in more into the draft and stuff as time goes on here. I don't think that they're done rebuilding in the trenches on either side. We spend a lot of time talking about the offensive side of the football there in the trenches, but on the defensive side, you know, they drafted Keanu Benton last year. I think that, that you know, pass the flying colors in terms of what he gave them as a rookie. Larry Ogunjobi is going to be a tough call, I think, this offseason for them in terms of should they move on. You know, I know that they gave him a new three year deal before last season, but they can get out from a lot of that contract and save money. Um, do they feel like he's worth it to keep around? I, I think if Cam were to hang them up, you almost have to bring Larry back. But if Cam's going to be back and Cam said that he was going to be on his podcast, but like, has that decision actually been made or is he just being facetious? You, you know, I don't know. Um, but let's let's assume that he's 100% committed to being back here next year. Uh, I, I think that gives you a little bit of a decision and some wiggle room in terms of what you could do with Larry. Now, regardless, I think this is a position you attack in this draft class. Um, I think there's kind of a sweet spot there, whether it's uh, you know some point on day two. It's not where I would go in the first round, but I think at some point on day two or early in round four, like with one of those round four picks, they have back-to-back picks right now in round four. Um, I kind of think that's a sweet spot for the defensive line. I just, I don't think that they're done rebuilding in that area. Um, but I agree like Cam Hayward, I would not have him playing above, you know, 70% of the snaps next year, especially when, you know, if it's a case like this year, which I hope it's not, but hopefully the offense is able to control more of the clock a la, you know, the Cincinnati game this past year. And we see a lot more games like that because then you can have him playing a lot more snaps because the total defense you're only playing like 40 um you know and and tj watt talked about that when the offense is able to control clock control time of possession we're able to be a fresher defense but obviously at this point of the his career i think less is going to be more for cam i think you'll see a more productive player when you limit his snaps obviously injury was kind of what told the story of his 2023 season um is he going to get back to 100 percent? i think that's a big question i can't answer that uh, I expect him to be back, though. I expect him to be better than he was in 2023, and I expect him to play less than he did uh, on a per game basis in 2024. Yeah, to get the best out of him, you got to kind of take the load management approach to to be able go. to, the NBA, to make the NBA. We are transitioning to the NBA. We got to <laughs> get those significant snaps, and, and we yeah. have to limit them um, because you want to keep him around. I, I agree with you. I think that the Steelers could move on from Larry Ogunjobi, but it just really depends on how they see them filling that room out. Because um, I think that when you talk about if Cam Hayward doesn't come back, then you're obviously going to attack this in the draft like you had mentioned. I don't see the Marvin Leal with the way Tomlin talked about him. He's probably out the door. I mean, yeah. You, d- you haven't seen the progression from him that you would hope um, yeah. out of college. Louder milk. Be- Louder milk. Um, I it's mean. Fine. Armin Maybe they Watt. bring back Monty Adams, who's a free agent. Armin Watts is also a free agent. Yeah, I mean, some decisions. There's guys that are on the team this year, but but it's going to be by committee if if you're talking without Cam. And if if Cam's mm-hmm. back, then you're going to need more people to step up um, whenever Cam's not on the field. Because there a, there's a clear difference from a healthy Cam Hayward being on the field than when he's not, especially in the run game. I just, I just think that that's something that is going to be a focus – for this offseason as well. Whether whether he comes back or not, they have to hit on somebody in the draft like they did with Keanu Benton. If they can get somebody where Keanu Benton can stay over in that, that zero technique full-time and then you have 
somebody that can fill in that, that three technique that, that Cam Hayward would be and nail someone in the draft that, that you get right away that could play significant snaps at the NFL level, I, I think that that would do wonders for the Steelers' defense. But regardless, if Cam comes back, you need to limit him. And, and like you said, 70% of the snaps, I mean, I, I, I know that he probably – as a player, you never want to have to do that, but I think the team will understand that this guy's not getting any younger. We want to keep him at the top of his game. We want to keep him healthy. That's something that you're just going to have to do, and that's something that the defense is going to have to make up the slack for. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, uh, next question comes from Mike in Illinois. Our guy, who do you want the Steelers to hire for OC? Um, you know, my number one candidate is off the board already. Uh, he's now the Bears offensive coordinator and Shane Waldron. I was he even off? Was he, was he on the board when we talked last week? Yeah, he just what got hired that? two da- two days ago. Oh, okay. Um, so for me now, you know, it was kind of a one A one B situation. So now I guess my de facto one A was my one B, uh, and that's Clint Kubiak, um, who would come from San Francisco. I look at so he does have some experience play calling. He did so with the Vikings in 2021, wasn't retained uh, after Kevin O'Connell took over for Mike Zimmer. But that offense was 12th in yards per game. They averaged 25 points per game. And we already brought up the fact that San Francisco with Brock Purdy is in the NFC championship game. And listen, I'm not trying to like slight Brock Purdy here like everybody else. You know, he gets a ton of slander for for what he does. Um, there's a lot of talent around him, plays in a great system. I get it. You know, he's still got to do his thing. But the development of him and getting him to this level, I think, relies a, or is on the shoulders a lot of Clint Kubiak and what he's been able to do with him and within that offense. Uh, obviously, he has the background. He's been around the game for a long time. Uh, I think everybody knows his, his father, Gary Kubiak, Texans coach. Um, he's just been around ball for so long, um, it, it, despite only being 36 years old. It's, it's it's funny. He's actually younger than Zach Robinson. We talk about how young Zach yeah. Robinson is. He's actually mm-hmm. a year younger. Um, so yeah, Clint Kubiak is my number one guy. Um, Zach Robinson actually is probably now my number two. I didn't view it as necessarily realistic because of the no play calling experience. Um, I don't know. I, I tweeted, and I don't know. I keep going back and forth on this. Who, if you were asking me, like the top three, just because, like, if Eric Bieniemy becomes available, if he get, kind of gets left out in the cold from Washington, if they go uh, with Ben Johnson and he doesn't retain him for whatever reason, I think automatically, like, he's he's going to be in the mix. But if the or the Steelers going to want to wait that process out uh, again. Um, so that's interesting. I, I think for me, the other guy would be Thomas Brown then from Carolina, also from the McVay tree, was his assistant coach when they won the Super Bowl, uh, was the offensive coordinator in Carolina. But now again, they're undergoing a head coaching change. Um, if he doesn't land somewhere else and he, if he gets left out in the cold and throughout the process, I'd be very interested in him. I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm just going to stick with my boy, Zach Robinson. That's who I talked yeah. about last week. That's what we talked about to open up the show. And I, I think that the reasons are valid for it. We, we talked about the type of offense that he could bring to the Steelers. Obviously, the lack of play calling is an issue um, or, or could be an issue. I don't want to say it is an issue. He might be fun, mm-hmm. just fine at it. Um, but that is a concern, obviously. And it's, it goes against the description that Tomlin had talked about what they were looking at bringing in because they talked about bringing in a guy that has experience at that. Um, but I, I think that the the upside to him and, and what he could do for this offense, what he could do for Kenny Pickett and these receivers, I think that that would be great uh, from from what we got from Matt Canada. Um, and obviously, I would love Click Kubiak. Don't get me wrong, I, I I would. Part of me is doing this just so we say different answers. Um, that those are easily like I, if if I'm if I'm being honest, like Click Kubiak might be my number one. Um, but I just I think that he's going to garner more attention in in this offseason than yeah. Zach Robinson probably will. And not to say the Steelers wouldn't get him, but I just think that there's going to be more competition for it. So I'll stick to my gun, Zach Robinson, especially for seeing what he did for my boy Puka Nakua this year. Everybody knows, BYU fan here. Got to gotta love that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think that there's some good options here. And I think either of those guys, and looking at the trees that they come from, I, what I mentioned earlier, like everybody wants a Shanahan or a McVay tree. And and getting either of those guys, I think would be great options. Um, we got a lot of similar questions here. So, you know, we'll go to Danny here who says, how realistic is it to, for us to land Kingsbury? Do you think that he's the top option? 
So I, I, I can't get into the Steelers' mind to know if he is the top option. As far as a realistic thing, be. as far as a from a realistic perspective, I'll be honest, it's probably pretty good uh, because you look at the two teams right now that he's interviewed with, right? Or rumored to interview with us. I don't think it's happened yet. Uh, but Chicago, they've filled that vacancy. Pittsburgh, they haven't. If he doesn't interview with anybody else, I, I certainly think it's on the table. Um, we've kind of already, I don't, I don't think it's worth regurgitating the same stuff over and over again. He's certainly not our, either of our top options. Um, I, I think there's a path to it working. I just don't think it's with the personnel that the Steelers have. And it's much easier to change one coach than it is the entire roster. So I just, I don't see it working here personally. Um, Tyler says, uh, while, while we're on ahead. the, while we're on the topic of Cliff Kingsbury, I wanted to bring this up. Mm-hmm. I reached okay. out to our, uh, our friend and who will remain nameless, but I just wanted to get something that we could say on the show quote from him because he had direct contact with Cliff Kingsbury covered the Cardinals with him. So I wanted to get his thoughts a little bit on it. He, I'm just going to sure. read a quote that he just sent me. It's really tough. On one hand, I think that the perception around him was, he was always going to be better, a better offensive coordinator than a head coach, and unfortunately, that came to fruition here. If he plans on running the same offense he did in college in Arizona, it's tough to see success coming in Pittsburgh just based on personnel and the quarterback situation. If Kyler couldn't win a playoff game as the perfect passer or perfect passer for his system, it's tough to think Kenny Mason or whoever could. The Cardinals did improve year by year until Cliff's fourth season, where he got fired but did his offensive design scheme and play calling get better over that stretch? There's a reason to the Cardinals cleaned house Jeez. and looked more balanced in this season. If the Steelers planned on dropping down to the NCAA, go for it. Cliff's track record as an offensive guy speaks for itself there, but he's yet to prove it at the pros and barring any massive schematic adjustments to what he does best, it's tough to see him thriving over there. Speaking of Pittsburgh. Jeez. Well, one, appreciate that response because they gave you, they give you a lot to work with there. They give you a very in-depth response there and a lot to digest. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I can't say summarized because that was very long-winded. Um, gave a lot of my same sentiments into how it would go, um, both on and off the field again. So appreciate that, nameless. Uh, What's funny is, 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 is he mentioned the Steelers dropping down to the NCAA. Mm-hmm. Little did he know, and everybody else know, they already play in the NCAA. Then they are the exact same team, the exact same color. It is the Iowa Hawkeyes. That's bad true. quarterback play, bad mm-hmm. offense, great defense. Mm-hmm. And their Black quarterback, and for whatever reason, always seems to be wearing number seven as well. So. I wonder why. Maybe maybe they, te- they like listen. You have to wear number seven. That's what Ben Big Ben looked like. We're trying to get some good mojo in here. Yeah. Well, this year they their guy wore number ten, right, Mitch, and he was terrible. Both he was them. awful. They averaged yeah. what? I'm. Uh, I don't even know. Nine points a game. I can't believe yeah. there was a there was a game against. Yeah, they, I believe it was them and Northwestern. The total was set at I think twenty and a half points, and it went under. Jeez. Um. Okay. Uh. Tyler said, "Loaded question. If it is Pickett, what OC do you think gets the most out of him, and what is the most?" And what is the most out of him or best do you think that he can produce? Um, despite what I just said about Kubiak and, and getting what he did out of Purdy and everything, Mark I'm actually going to go back. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the Zach Robinson. Well, and I think the reason being it's more, it's not so much about Kenny as it is about everybody else around him and being able to get those guys uh, in better positions. L- let's be honest. While the majority of the Steelers' problems offensively this year were certainly quarterback play, I-, I think there was a lot to be desired from the scheme itself as well, the route spacing as well, the play calling. Um, I think that he would mask a lot of those areas. So I don't know if it's so much about Kenny himself. I think it's about everybody else around him making him look like a competent NFL quarterback. In terms of what that is um you know i i think you're being a little bit too bold if you think he's even going to be able to get to a top 20 level based off what we've seen um but i certainly think 
that it's, it's within the realm of possibility with a actual offensive coordinator that knows how to draw things up and get people in space, utilize the weapons that the Steelers have, that he can look like a, you know a top 25, at least a game manager type level. And the game manager thing is thrown around, so I shouldn't even say that because like people will strap that now to very good quarterbacks like Jared Goff. So, But at least an average level that you can win with, the Steelers can win with, get to the playoffs with, and maybe win a playoff game with. Uh, I think that's within the realm of possibility, and I think Zach Robinson is probably the number one guy, if I'm looking specifically at that, I would look to. When I look to think of the level of quarterback play that I think would be an improvement or considered an improvement, and I would happily accept, I look at those last three regular season games of what Mason Rudolph provided. If 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 you can get that realistically from Kenny Pickett, game in and game out, where he throws for around 200 yards, and he maybe throws for a touchdown, possibly two every every few games. Oh, I I I don't think that that's asking too much, and I don't think that that's setting the bar that high. You saw what Mason Rudolph was able to do in those three games. You saw the offense be able to flourish in those games. He does not need to be the savior of the offense. He does not need to be a Josh Allen, a Patrick Holmes, Lamar Jackson, everybody that you want to talk about that's in the AFC, all of the good quarterbacks who the offense runs through them. He doesn't need to be that. He, and like you said, I don't want to like everybody throws around game manager, but that's that's literally what he needs to be. If he can, if he can go for around uh, two hundred yards and a touchdown, maybe two every. Just I won't want to say every game, just every couple games, every few games. Give me two touchdowns. I think that that would be perfectly acceptable. I think from an offensive coordinator, if you got him to that point week in and week out this upcoming season, I think that that would be a massive improvement for what we've seen so far. I also would like to add, I want to go back to the whole Pep Hamilton thing. Like, I think that the offensive coordinator hire is obviously much more important, but I think pairing a good QB coach and maybe even another offensive, like we're, the size of the staff, I think needs to get larger as well. Like while I'm not necessarily on board with him as an OC man, like if Arthur Smith doesn't land an offensive coordinator job somewhere else, bring him on the staff to do something on the offense, offensive analyst, senior offensive analyst, uh, assistant head coach, some role for the offense. Uh, just support this offense with as many capable offensive minds as possible. I, I know Arthur Smith got a lot of crap because, I mean, I, I get it. No, Bajan Robinson, Kyle Pitts, like how are those guys not featured parts of that offense? But you go back to what he did in Tennessee with Derrick Henry, with A.J. Brown, with Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill looking like he did for a couple seasons under the tutelage of Arthur Smith as the offensive coordinator. I mean, they certainly could run the ball there if nothing else. And Ryan Tannehill had a year where he threw like 34 touchdowns. I mean, ridiculous. So I don't know. I, I think that while these are very important hires and you need to hit home runs on them for sure, I think you also need to expand the number of people on the staff. I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure yeah. 34 touchdowns would probably triple Kenny Pickett's output in the for per first two seasons of his career. It would do more than double for sure. I think it'd be t- like two and a half. Yeah. We need to answer this. I need this answered right now. Hold on. How many do you think he's thrown? Season. 13. 13 total? Yeah. Yeah, it is 13. 13 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. I thought I'd seen it somewhere. So yeah, that's like two and a half seasons. Yeah. 34? I mean, that's two two off of trip or no, uh, you know, yeah, that's two and a half seasons. A little over two and a half seasons. It's, it's nuts. Um, we anyway. struggle. <laughs> yes, they have. Uh, Nick says Steelers free agency prediction. I got one for you on each side of the football. Juwan Jennings currently from San Francisco. And, and the reason that I will throw this guy out there is because whether I think it's, if it's Zach Robinson or it's Kubiak, you need your receiver. You need receivers that can block, especially slot receivers that can block. Um, <laughs> funny enough. Allen Robinson would actually probably fit the bill if he had any bit of athleticism left in him and made sense <laughs> to bring back. Um, but Juwan Jennings, who I think is a perfectly viable slot receiving option as a receiver too, I think he kind of, you know, he gets under, there's too many weapons within that San Fran offense for him to really be a featured part of it. Um, but he's certainly capable. And I think that this offense kind of requires a receiver like that to be within it. Uh, whether that is Zach Robinson or Kubiak, I think both of them could definitely utilize a receiver like that. So there's the one on offense. For defense, I, I had a hard time picking between a safety and a corner. Uh, 
Ultimately, I think they need somebody that can play on the outside at corner. I think they'll look to free agency for that and then kind of go a different direction. Like they can get a safety in free agency too, but I think they'll probably look for their nickel in the draft just because of the way that the draft class uh, is set up. They could also, an outside corner could be taken within the first first pick, if not the first couple rounds, and it wouldn't surprise me, but I still think you need a veteran in that room too. Uh, I'm going to go Sean Murphy bunting here, a guy that I thought they could look at potentially – uh, around the trade deadline from Tennessee. He's set to hit free agency again after signing just a one-year deal in Tennessee. Uh, I like the scheme fit. I think he makes a ton of sense for Terrell Austin's defense, who you know prioritizes their corners that can use their eyes, uh, can, can play multiple different defenses. I kind of like the fit for sure on the back end. Um, he might even be able to do some different things for you in terms of like what Patrick Peterson was doing, playing a little bit of safety too. Um, he gives you the inside outside versatility. So if you don't get Cooper DeGene, you know, to play in the slot, Sean Murphy Bunton could also play in the slot. So I definitely like that fit. I'm gonna give two names and one's been circling around. I know a lot. Um, and it's definitely the the Homer pick because he's from Pittsburgh. Tyler Boyd uh, offensively. Oh, are they okay? Yeah, I thought you were gonna say uh, I'll I'll say it afterwards in case you were just say his name too. Offensively or defensively? Defensively. Okay. Um, I doubt it's going to be. No, it's, so it's not, not also. It. It's not also a hometown kid. No. Okay. Jordan Whitehead's a free agent again. No, this so is one that's going to, it's one that's going to fit the bill for past signings for Steelers, but it's not going to be necessarily somebody that you want. I'm just going to, oh, I'm just going to okay. put that out there. Nice. Um, Great. But offensively, Tyler Boyd, Steelers are going to be looking for another wide receiver three. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would assume. I don't think Calvin Austin is going to be that wide receiver three next year. And I don't think that the Steelers are going to find a wide receiver three in the draft. Um, I think that they're going to look towards free agency to do that. I think Tyler Boyd makes a lot of sense. He's been a solid wide receiver three for the last few seasons on the Bengals. I don't think anybody would complain about his play over in Cincinnati. I think it's time for him to come home where – I know a lot of people have always wanted him to be and be able to play in Heinz Field as, on a regular basis again as a part of the Steelers. Secondly, this is the one where I I, I don't necessarily it's want Cliff it. Kingsbury, it, isn't it? It's an idea. <laughs> it's Cliff <laughs> Kingsbury. Yeah. No, but this is this might be an idea uh, just because I look at the signing of like Patrick Peterson, older guy, used to be really good. Um, it is in the secondary. A name that just like it comes to my mind is Stephon Gilmore. I mean, he played in Dallas this past season, ah, and yeah. I just I think feel like got, I, I, I really think good. I think he's better than what Patrick Peterson provided, or like what we reviewed Patrick Peterson as, um, not mm -hmm. as washed up. But I I do see this as very much like a Steelers signing, where it's like it could be on a discount. He's an older guy; that he's getting up there, but they do need some secondary help. I think that it could be an option. Okay, I don't hate it. And because I think that they're also going to draft a guy. So, and Patrick Peterson could definitely stick around on a reworked deal to play safety. So, you know, those two guys as mentors to continue for Joey Porter Jr. and whoever else that they were to get, I definitely don't hate it because I still think Gilmore's got enough left in the tank to play too. And Gilmore can hand over the defensive player of the year award he should have, uh, should have given to TJ <laughs> years ago. Um, all right, this is the last one, uh, and it comes back to Cliff Kingsbury. Would Kingsbury somehow be worse, a worse option than Canada as offensive coordinator, John says? That's interesting. I think he'd... yes, 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 yes. He sucks. He sucks. He sucks. He sucks. And Canada, I don't think it, I don't think I've made this very clear yet. I have. Canada was not the biggest problem for the Steelers. I know a lot of you don't want to accept that. He wasn't. The quarterback play was. You saw a good quarterback play at the end of the season in the same exact offense. He would be worse. Uh, yeah, well, while I definitely agree with, with both those sentiments, I think it's for sure different. Like, where you would maybe make up a little bit with the passing game being a little bit more developed, I think you're losing the run game from the offense as well. So I think at the end of the day, it balances out, and they're probably pretty even. But if you ask me to like really nitpick here, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it flopped worse than Matt Canada's offense did here. And it's mainly due to the personnel. Like, again, I think there is a world where it's it's doable, uh, even though I don't like the fit of you know the air raid offense in the NFL in general. I think there is a world where like the personnel can definitely do it, just not the personnel in Pittsburgh. I, yeah, 
It's, it doesn't make sense. It makes zero sense for this team. The way the offense is constructed by the personnel makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Should we? I don't know if we should answer this one on the Steelers one or wait because, okay, the person has Steelers in their name. So Ian, the Steelers in that, says, which of the three pro sports teams will be the next to advance around in the postseason? Well, how about this? I mean, we're we're recording several podcasts tonight. We're breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Everybody knows that. We can see they can see what we're wearing the same clothes three days in a row. Um, mm-hmm. we'll just answer it on each one, and we'll say we yeah. we can say our reasoning for or or against what we're going to say. So, I'll start this one off, okay. and I do think it's the Steelers. Uh, I, I I do, and I, that's okay. it. Goes back to the reasoning of why I said. I don't think that they're that far off. Obviously, the, the things that they need to improve on are very important. They're, they're, they're literally some of the keys to your team and keys to your player personnel, the quarterback, most important position. you got to figure that out. But I think that when you look at the state of the Steelers and w- how f- close they are to getting past and winning a playoff game compared to what we've seen from the Penguins. Penguins didn't even make the, po- the postseason last year. This year, still up in the air. Pirates, as much as I would like to say, and I actually believe in the Pirates a lot more than probably people would think, baseball's just an unfair game, and the fewest amount of teams make it to the postseason in baseball. It's just it's just that much harder in baseball, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think even though the Pirates have some things going for them, I just I it's hard for me to see them getting over that hump before a team like the Steelers would. So I don't think it's the Steelers, and the only reason is I think that they're going to continuously be in that mix, but until they completely have quarterback solved, I just think it's going to be the same story of them getting to the playoffs, but then having to match up with one of these aliens at quarterback and going one and done. Um, so until they get that figured out now, they could have that figured out by the time, you know, in a couple of years and still be the first Pittsburgh team to advance in the postseason for sure. I just, I'm not putting my chips there. Okay. Guess we'll find out on a later episode this week which <laughs> one Smitty thinks. I already yep. revealed mine and you'll hear my reasons as to why. Uh yeah. you're gonna be one, on the so. you're gonna be on the other one saying why it wasn't those ones, like yeah. I just did about the Steelers. Um yeah, I definitely think that they're going to be regulars in the playoffs. I just the I question think is one and done. Just so I'm clarified, the question is winning one game, right? Like at the least for the Steelers, for the Steelers, Steelers winning one game. It's just winning one game. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, I'm still going to pick the Steelers right now. Mm-hmm. Now, from from that standpoint, like I get anybody could win one game, so yeah, like they. I mean, have, look at looking at this year. Obviously, the game ended on a, like a 17 point swing, or not 17, 13 point. What? How how big did we lose this this year? 31 17. Thir- yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 14 point swing. I mean, the Steelers were a touchdown away from tying the game. You talk about some of the turnovers that yeah. they they don't give up in that game. Obviously, yeah. Buffalo still probably ends up winning the game, but they weren't that far off. Mm-hmm. I know. I did it. Um, but yeah, I'll explain on a later episode if you guys are watching. Uh, so you'll have to tune in to the Penguins and Pirate shows, which will be out the following two days uh, when we record these. We record all these on the same day, uh, but we put out the Steelers show, then the Penguins show then the Pirates show and back-to-back-to-back days. So this is the Around the 412 Steelers show. Uh, Tyler, anything else? No. Uh, I just I want more offensive coordinator news. I want to know who they're yeah. interviewing. I want to see just, just I mean, more of that time, in the upcoming days. I mean, by the time do, we're talking do next you week, think – should... I want a prediction. I want a prediction from you. Just okay. gut reaction. Do you think that this will be wrapped up before the Super Bowl? Hmm. Very close. I think it'll be the week of, whether it's before or after. Uh, I'll say yes. There we go. I think by the time we're talking next week, we're talking about who they're having second interviews with. Well, they're going to have a first interview with uh, Clint Kubiak because the Detroit Lions are going to beat the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> Perfect. That that all sounds good to me because I want the Lions to win and I want Clint Kubiak. So. Same. <laughs> uh, check out the links in the description of this Facebook and Etsy links for everything custom designs. Our friend Haley Wagner, small business, get yourself a custom hoodie, t-shirt, 
bunch of different clothing items. Uh, Valentine's Day around the corner, maybe get something Valentine's Day themed for your Valentine or or around the four one two themed. Or around the 412 themed. Um, one of these days, I will definitely wear those shirts again on the show. It's just been too cold to rock a t-shirt on here. So that ain't happening on my end. But check that out. Uh, everything but hats, custom designs by Haley Wagner. Get at her. She does great work. Uh, for Tyler, for Smitty, this has been the Around the 412 Steelers show. Go click on another video popping up right now. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.